for you guys today as we enter the Harambe Wildlife Preserve. Just a quick reminder before we get started, please remember to remain seated with your hands, arms, feet, and legs inside the vehicle at all times for your safety and the safety of the animals. Now we are beginning our journey in the Little Ituri Forest. The Ituri Forest is known for species that use camouflage as a means of protection. So they are sometimes a little bit shyer and a little bit harder to spot. But it does look like over on the right hand side there is the Ohaki. And the Ohaki has stripes on its legs that make it look like it is related to the zebra, but it is not. It's actually more closely related to the giraffe. And we know that by the skull shape. It has the same skull shape, and it also has the same long prehensile tongue that it uses to strip leaves from the twigs and bushes and trees of the forest. Now up ahead on the ridge on the right, there is a very large black and white bird that is a saddle-billed stork. The saddle-billed stork does get its name for the yellow shield on its bill that looks like a saddle. It is a pretty large bird as well. It's about five feet tall with a nine foot wingspan. For reference, that is about the same width as the canvas above your heads. Now we are going to continue on throughout the forest and see what else we can find. Now over here on the left hand side, there is a bongo. Bongos are nicknamed the ghosts of the forest because they're pretty shy and reclusive and they are excellent hiders. When they don't want to be seen, you will not be able to see them. Now we are going to continue on though with that bongo. That does mean that we are exiting the forest and we're headed up and along the Safi River. Now the Safi River is a watering hole and it does act as a gathering place for some of the more aquatic species here on the reserve. So as we're traveling upstream over on the right hand side, there are two species. The first is the eastbound pelicans. They are the large white birds. They do get their name for a pink color they turn during their mating season, which happens around the springtime. And then right next to them hanging out are the Nile hippopotamus. So Nile hippopotamus are quite large and they're usually aquatic. They're usually hanging out like the ones over here on the left hand side are in the water because they're very sensitive to the heat. They don't have great heat resistance. So they will in fact stay as submerged as possible most of the time. They will hold their breath for up to eight minutes. And then when they do come up for air, their eyes, ears, and nose all sit on the top of their skull which means they can just poke those features out of the water, get a big breath, take a quick look around, and then sink back down. They also don't swim, even though they are pretty aquatic. Instead, they will sink all the way to the bottom of the river and they will walk across it. Now over here on the left hand side, there is another species that calls the river home. That species is the Nile crocodile. Nile crocodile are also quite large. They are 16 feet in length and 500 pounds when they are fully grown. Wow. They might notice they're not moving too much, but that's because they are feeding in the water. They only eat about once a week as well, and that is because in a single meal they do eat up to half of their body weight. So a lot of food being consumed at one time. Now we are continuing on. We are headed away from the river, which does mean that we are headed towards a change in scenery because we are about to enter the open plains of the African savanna. Now, the African savanna is home to some of the more famous species you might recognize, like the giraffe, elephant, and the lion. So hopefully we will see a few of those familiar faces as we travel through today. We are currently passing through Savannah Overlook, which gets its name because as we travel down, you can look out and over and we'll see the entire open plains portion of the savannah and maybe spot a few of the species we will be on our journey. Oh my god, look! They're going to be on your side, the giraffes. Yeah. It does look like just as we're entering, there are a few species here to greet us over here on the right hand side. There is 
Ann Coley cattle are also called the Tusi cattle for the people who first domesticated them. They are one of two domesticated species here on the reserve. And those horns are very impressive, but they are also quite light. They're actually hollow on the inside with a honeycomb-like structure that aids in blood circulation to keep them cool in the hotter parts of the day. Now hanging out with the Ann Coley cattle were the Maasai giraffe. We know they're Maasai giraffe because of the pattern of their spots. They're a little different from other species of giraffe. They're much more jagged and irregular. Other species of giraffe have a much more uniform look to their pelt. Now up ahead it does look like there are a couple more migrating species. There are the wildebeest and the zebra. So we're going to swing around and see if we can get a better view of them. Before we do though, there is a species here on the left hand side. They're laying down, they're a little harder to see, but they're behind the cave on the right. Those are painted dogs. Painted dogs are also called African wild dogs, but they get the name painted for the color of their pelt. Now over here on the left hand side as well are a couple of species. There are the little beast and the antelope, but also the sable antelope over there. Sable antelope also get their name for the color of their pelt. And then the wildebeest are one of the largest migrating species in the world. They will migrate up to a thousand miles in search of watering holes and feeding grounds. And they do travel in groups of up to 1.5 million individuals. These groups are so large they can actually be seen from outer space. Which does mean the herd here on the reserve is very small as it bears it. Over here on the left hand side are also the Hartman's Mountain Zebra. Now mountain zebra are distinguishable from other species of zebra because of an extra flap of skin underneath their neck. That extra flap is called a dewlap and much like the Ann Coley cattle's horns it aids in blood circulation to keep them cool in the hotter parts of the day. Now a group of zebra is called a dazzle and that is for their strike pattern. It is unique to the individual so no two are alike just like the human fingerprint. It is actually how they tell each other apart and how they can predators when they're traveling in large herds. Now a herd of giraffe is called a tower and that is for their height. They are the tallest animal in the world. Adults can sit anywhere between 18 and 20 feet tall when they are fully grown and a newborn calf is actually about six feet tall which does mean that when they are first born the giraffe is already taller than the average human. Now giraffes will do one thing all day, every day, which is eat. They will spend 16 to 20 hours of their day doing so. And they will utilize their long tongues to do so. Their tongues are about 18 inches in length, which means they are so long that they can in fact lick their own eyeballs. <laughs> now because they spend so much time eating, they don't spend that much time sleeping. A giraffe will only sleep for about 20 to 30 minutes out of their day, and they don't lay down to do so. Because it's very awkward for a giraffe to get back up once they've decided to lay down because of their height. So it makes them vulnerable to do so. So the only time you will see a giraffe laying down is if they feel very safe and comfortable in their surrounding environment. Yeah. So it looks like we are going to continue on ahead. It looks like some more of the tower are over here on the left hand side, just as we're starting to come to the edge of the open plane. Oh, it's 2.30 to 3.30. Oh my god. Oh, wow. 2.30. Oh, 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 so it's actually quite interesting when giraffe decide to run. So when a giraffe walks at just a normal leisurely pace, they pick one foot off the ground at a time. But when they're running, they pick two or three feet off all at once. So when they go from walking to running, it kind of looks really awkward because they're having to change their gait. Now we are continuing on. We are headed out of the open plains of the sand and into elephant territory. Elephants are over here on the right hand side. Oh, yeah. Just oh, yeah. 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 
what I thought. Now we know they're African elephants because of the shape of their ears. Their ears are shaped like the continent itself. And also while we're over here on the left hand side, there is a troop of mandrels. They're sitting up on this rock here. Mandrels are the largest species of monkey in the world. The male can actually weigh about 100 pounds when fully grown. Now these two elephants are a female pair. They are actually sisters. And we know that because they are together, that's how we know they're females. Females will always travel in herds that are family units, so they're all related in one way or another. And they are led by a dominant matriarch. The matriarch is usually the oldest of the group, and we also say that she is the wisest. Because elephants actually have an amazing memory. They will remember just about everything that they come across throughout their entire lives. So since the matriarch is the oldest, that means she has been around the longest and has the best and most memory of all of the watering holes and feeding grounds that the herd has traveled to in the past and may need to travel to in the future. So the rest will happily follow her lead because they know that she knows where she is going. Now males, on the other hand, will always be alone most of the time. That's because once they reach maturity, they separate from the herd to live the solitary life of a bachelor. Once in a while, you will see two or three males hanging out together in very loosely formed groups that we call bachelor groups. There's not much loyalty behind them though, and they're easily broken apart, so it's pretty rare to see those. Now, on either side of the truck here, you'll see some tusk marks or footprints in the red clay that's surrounding us. We are passing through red clay pits, and red clay is a favorite snack of the elephant. Those tusk marks and footprints mean they have probably traveled through here recently. They actually like to eat red clay because it is rich in minerals that provide the nutrients they need in their everyday diet that they may not necessarily be able to find elsewhere. So we say that red clay is kind of like their own personal multivitamin. Now we are going to continue on. That looks like over here on the left hand side there is another elephant. You'll notice that this elephant is throwing mud across its back and the rest of its body. This is something they do on purpose as a means of protection for themselves because elephants have very sensitive skin that burns quite easily in the hot savanna sun. So they will in fact roll around and throw mud and dirt across their backs as a form of protection. <laughs> now we are going to continue on. I do believe that his friend is up ahead. That is a male elephant, and this one over here is also a male. These are part of a bachelor herd, like I was saying. They're kind of like brothers. Now we are going to continue on though, we're going to say goodbye to the elephants and we're going to say hello to the flamboyants that we're currently passing. Uh, flamboyants is what we call a group of flamingo because of their coloration. They are pink. Now these are greater flamingo, they are the lightest of pink and the largest of the flamingo species. I feel like mostly a couple of them are not pink in color, instead they are white and black. That's because they are the young. The young are not considered mature until they're about two years old, at which point they will start developing their colorations that they get from their diet, which does consist mainly of brine shrimp. Now we are going to continue on. We are passing a little deeper into the forest as we go, and we are currently passing by mudwallow. Now mudwallow is a good indicator that there are species in the area, because a lot of species, just like the elephants, do use mud as a means of protection mm -hmm. from the sun, as well as a bug repellent. You'll see many species rolling around in dirt or mud to keep those pesky flies off. And as we travel around the mud wallow, we are headed towards the Kopi Rocks. The Kopi Rocks are a very large rock formation that many species use as a lookout to kind of get a survey of the area. So we are going to if we can find any as we travel up towards it. Oh, there. Now you see her just through the trees. The sun hits her just right sometimes where you can see her, but a lot of the times they are pretty hard to spot. But that is a cheetah. 
Cheetah are the fastest land animal in the world. They can actually get up to about 70 miles per hour in three seconds. So very fast. And they're also a little bit unique amongst the big cats. For example, they cannot roar. Instead of roaring, they emit a high pitched chirping noise that sounds almost like a Now over here on the right hand side, for those of you who have not spotted it yet, there is a white rhino. White rhino are quite large, about 5,000 pounds when they are fully grown. There are a couple more cheetah up here as well. For those who didn't see the first one. The white do get their name from the Afrikaans word vice, which means wide, not white. It's for that upper lip of theirs. There was a little bit of a mistranslation when it was being brought over to English, though, which is how they ended up being called the white rhino. Now we are going to continue on. We're going to see what else we can find. It does look like there are a couple more of those rhino up ahead over on the right hand side, so we're just going to get a better view of them. Now, white rhino are also pretty social, so they will travel in large herds called crashes. And they are called crashes because they have poor eyesight. So they don't see very well. Instead, they do utilize their sense of hearing to figure out what's going on around them. Now, over here on the left hand side, right next to the truck on the ground here, is an ostrich. Oh, how you doing? Ostriches are the largest species of bird in the world. They sit between six and nine feet tall when they are fully grown. That one is a female, and we know that because of the coloration of her feathers. Her feathers are gray. Male ostriches' feathers are black and much more vibrant. Okay, now over here on the left hand side is another species that loves to hang out on the ground. This is a pride of lions. Now they are demonstrating what lions do all day every day, which is sleep. They will sleep up to 20 hours a day. And then at night when the sun goes down, they will get up and start going about their business. The females will go out and they will hunt for their prey, while the male will hang back and guard the territory. He usually does this by roaring. A lion's roar can actually be heard up to six miles away. Now over here on the left, you'll see them laying down next to this tree. They look like hairy logs. Those are warthogs. Oh. Warthogs are the largest species of burrowing animal in the world. They can dig their burrows out with their razor sharp tusks and then they actually back into those burrows with their tusks facing out. And that's the world of competitors or competition that might come their way. Looks oh, like another one of those ostriches is up walking around. Ostriches are flightless birds. They do not use their wings to get around. Instead they use their legs. They're very powerful. They can actually run at about 40 miles per hour. Now we are continuing on. We're going to start heading out of the forest of the Savannah and we're headed into Magadi Glen. So Magadi Glen is where our warden's host is. And our warden has been keeping some Nigerian dwarf goats recently. So we're going to see if we can find them as we travel through. Nigerian dwarf goats are a very small species of goats that are very and very easy yeah. to upteach. They don't take up too much room. And they do provide a rich milk oh, no. that the farmers keep sell for a profit. Oh, very useful livestock. Animal looks like they have decided to sit on the Jeep. Oh. Now something else that the farmers use is the yellow structure in the middle of the yard. That will be turned into a beehive and it will be utilized in a beehive fence. The beehive fence was first created because not long ago in Africa there was actually conflict between the farmers and the elephants because the farmers were laying down their crop plants in the middle of elephant migration paths. Now elephants, like I said, have an amazing memory, so they remembered these pathways to be where they needed to travel and they weren't going to change them, so they'd end up walking right through those crop lands, raiding them and destroying them. Well, this upset the farmers, so they reached out for help across the world to a couple different organizations. Here in Harambe, we were one of those organizations because at the time we were actually studying the elephants, and more specifically, we were studying their vocalization patterns. We were studying how they speak in very low vibrations, which are actually disrupted by the buzzing that bees give off. So elephants don't like bees very much. When they hear them, they will steer clear. We took this knowledge that we had about the elephants and the bees, and we got together with the conservation effort happening in Africa. And all together, we came up with the idea for the beehive fence. So now the farmers utilize these fences to surround their croplands, and the elephants have learned to stay away. 
They have found newer and safer migration paths that are much easier for them to travel on, as well as the bee population being helped out by these fences. It has gone up in Africa, and the farmers, because they are the ones keeping the bees, do get to sell the honey the bees produce for profit. So you could say that it is a win-win for all parties involved. So my friends here in Harambe, we do not like to say goodbye because it is far too sad 